morning to welcome uh, Professor Shaul Magid, the J. and Jamie Schottenstein Professor of Jewish Studies and Professor of Religious Studies at Indiana University at Bloomington. Uh, Professor Magid is among the leading scholars uh, of Judaism today. Uh, he's an ex a renowned expert in uh, the history of Judaism and gender, Hasidism, Kabbalah, uh, on the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, and particularly relevant today's talk on American Jewish thought and religion. He's currently the foremost expert uh, on the history of Rabbi Meir Kahane, uh, who we're going to hear about this morning. Uh, Professor Magid's most recent book is entitled Hasidism Incarnate, Hasidism, Christianity, and the Construction of Modern Judaism, published in 2014. Uh, and his current book project, and you were saying this is like a little up in the air, maybe the title, uh, but it's currently called American Jewish Survivalism, Meir Kahane, and the Politics of Pride. He's a fellow at the Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's a senior research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. And we are really delighted to have uh, <coughs> such a leading expert and a wonderful speaker um, come to, to present the Chrome series. Um, after the talk, uh, Marty, I don't see you, but Marty is going to um, lead a small discussion group upstairs if you're interested in taking the discussion further. Um, so uh, that will be an opportunity to, to discuss the issues further. So without further ado, thank you, Professor McGid. Thank you all. Can, can people hear me? Yes. Right? Okay. Uh, thank you all uh, for coming out on this beautiful Sunday morning. And thank you, um, David, Marty, and Mark, and Josh Shane, who's a friend of mine who, uh, who's not here right now, for the invitation. When I first actually proposed this title, which is part of a book project that I'm working on, and we uh, secured this date, I didn't realize it until a few days ago, but um, Friday, this, this past Friday, was the 25th um, yurt site of Mayor Kahana, who was assassinated 25 years ago uh, on last Friday in New York. I didn't realize that that was the case. Uh, but it is uh, serendipitous in some way that I'm, I've come here to talk about him. Now, most people know about Mayor Kahana from his career in Israel and his family of the Koch Party, um, which eventually became a party in the Knesset. Uh, after which the, uh, the, Israeli, the Israeli parliament and Supreme Court passed a racism law that actually ousted him and his party from the Knesset in 1986. Um, and most when, when you hear the name Mayor Kahan, that's usually what you think of. But actually, I think as a figure, he's much more interesting as a critic of American Judaism in the 60s and 1970s than he is in terms of being an Israeli politician or a Zionist ideologue. And my book is really focused on uh, on Kahana's work on American Judaism. He, he really continues to be a critic of American Judaism and writes to and about American Jews even after he immigrates to Israel in 1971 throughout his adult life. And in 1983, he wrote a book called Why Be Jewish, which is a book on intermarriage. It's not a very well-known book. Most people who know of Kahana don't really even know about the book. But I want to kind of focus this talk on a rendering of that book in a kind of larger context. Uh, and I want to talk about the question of Jewish identity and the, uh, the question of intermarriage in, um, in American Judaism, both earlier in the 60s and 70s, but probably uh, up until the present. The question, why be Jewish, is by definition reactive and even defensive. It's different than the question, how to be Jewish. By the time we ask the question, how to be Jewish, we've already assumed in some way the answer to the question, why be Jewish? The why question is really an extension, an existential one. The how question is really a practical one. So I would suggest that the question, how to be Jewish, was un the underlying question of the Kirov movement that flourished in post-war America through the 1980s when the question, why be Jewish, wasn't yet fully operational. At that time, many American Jews, this is up until the 1980s, at that time, many American Jews had 
still had European grandparents, and their emotional tie to their Jewish past was often more tangible. For example, the subtitle of the 1971 to 1973 three volumes called The Jewish Catalogs, which some of you might be familiar with, which really was a product of the baby boomers coming of age. The subtitle of the Jewish catalogs was Do-It-Yourself Judaism. More a response of how to be Jewish rather than why be Jewish. If we can take the catalogs as an example of one particular moment in post-war American Judaism, it's noteworthy that it is not, it is not compelled by the question why at all. Who is a Jew, as opposed to why be Jewish, how to be Jewish, who is a Jew is a question that sounds more familiar to, the, to, uh, to those of us over the age of 50, which apparently is all of us. <laughs> <laughs> almost, almost all of us, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the question of who is a Jew is really more a question of communal boundaries rather than personal identity. The question of who is a Jew really took two forms in post-war Jewelry. First, the question of Jewishness as determining the law of return in Israel, illustrated by the famous Brother Daniel case in the early 1960s, when a Jewish convert to Christianity who became a monk sought immigration to Israel under the law of return. It's a rare case where the rabbinic, there's a rabbinic leniency in Israel. The Israeli rabbinate determined that Brother Daniel was a Jew under halakha, and yet the Israeli Supreme Court determined that he was not a Jew under the law of return. It turned out that Brother Daniel eventually did immigrate to Israel, and he lived in a monastery, a Benedictine monastery in Haifa, where he, where he passed away and was buried. The second who is a Jew was really a question driving the reform movement in America to include patrilineal descent, which in future generations would make it very difficult to ascertain Jewish ancestry according to traditional Jewish law. In this case, who is a Jew is a question of communal belonging created by American Judaism where reform is still its largest denomination. Why be Jewish is a very different question that has arguably become central for today's millennial generation. Regarding the less personal question, must, must, must one be Jewish? or must Jews be Jewish? If we ask the question, must Jews be Jewish, I think that we can all agree that the answer is no. What I mean is that the tolerance in American, in American society doesn't demand or even compel Jews to be Jewish, nor does it punish Jews for being Jewish. Like most other life choices, Jewishness in today's America is voluntary. Thus the common adage that in America today, all Jews are Jews by choice. Jews by choice used to be a term that referred to converts. To spin one side of Sartre's argument in anti-Semite Jew in a different context, this is one price of living in a society where one's Jewishness is no longer defined by the non-Jewish majority. One can choose to be an affiliated Jew in America today and live safely outside any Jewish community, can flourish in the workplace, can find happiness and relevant to our concerns, can easily marry a non-Jew and raise a family fully accepted into American society. In fact, according to the recent Pew poll, about 70% of American Jews, if we exclude the Orthodox, are doing just that. According to the Pew poll, if we exclude the Orthodox from the equation, about 70% of American Jews are marrying non-Jews. What I'd like to do this morning is to explore with you the question of intermarriage in contemporary Amer America around this question, why be Jewish? The question implies not just why be Jewish, but why marry Jewish? Much good work has been done on Jewish intermarriage in America, mostly by social, social scientists and historians. My explanation will be a little bit different. It will focus on the answers given to the contemporary question, why be Jewish, and the accompanying question, why marry Jewish, arguing that the answers given in various quarters to the first question do not, in fact, and cannot answer the second. Is intermarriage the price we pay for advancing the American Jewish project? 
a price that, in my estimation, will not destroy the Jewish people, but will certainly alter its construction. The title of this talk, Why Be Jewish, and its relation to intermarriage, was sparked by two separate but connected pieces of writing. The first is a recent essay, actually it was a few years ago, that sailed around the internet called Millennials Are Asking Why Be Jewish. That was the title of the essay. Millennials Are Asking Why Be Jewish. It was published in the New Jersey New Jewish News by a young millennial Jew named David Walensky, who was a program associate, or was a program associate, for the New Jersey Outreach Institute. The essay doesn't contain much substance, but in my view speaks directly to the issue. The question, who, the question what, who is a Jew, Walensky asks, is passé. Because it begins with the binary of an us and a them that he claims is no longer operative. He writes, the premise of us and them is as boring and potentially harmful as the question it gives rise to. The intention of the essay was to serve as, to serve as a jolt to the professional Jewish establishment to spend their time and energy, in his words, asking the wrong question. The second reason for the title, Why Be Jewish, is that, is that it is the title of a 1983 book why Be Jewish, Intermarriage, Assimilation, and Alienation, written by Mayor Kahana. It's not very well known that Kahana, having immigrated to Israel in 71, <coughs> wrote a book about intermarriage in America in 1983. And another book about American democracy and the Jews called Time to Go Home. And another one in 1978 about the UN resolution equating Zionism with racism, called Listen World, Listen Jew. And another about topics of interest directly related to American Jewry. We usually think of Kahana as a militant right-wing Zionist and ideologue, which of course he was. In fact, the larger project of which this talk is a small part argues that Kahana was a quintessentially American Jewish thinker throughout his life, even after his immigration to Israel in 1971. For me, the most interesting things about Kahana are the things he wrote about American Jews and not about Israel. The problem with attempting a scholarly analysis of Kahana is that as a writer, he's often simplistic and almost always reactionary. He writes in a declarative, almost prophetic-like manner, flattening the complex phenomena to serve his ideological goals. Yet underneath it all, there's a substantive critique worthy of our attention. And as important, I think, today's American Jewish community in 2015 and this, in certain, in certain ways, is the kind of the, uh, the, the underside of the book, or the subversive part of the book. I think that today's American Jewish community, in, ways, in many ways unbeknownst to them, have adopted more of Kahana's worldview than we are often willing to admit. Kahana was a combination of ideologue, journalist, and activist, a master of guerrilla street theater, and an expert media hound. He wasn't a scholar. He had a solid knowledge base of classical Jewish literature, having studied in yeshiva in Brooklyn for over a decade. He had little knowledge of scholarship, nor did he read, read widely in scholarly literature. He was, however, a voracious consumer of the media. In his books, he often strings together news stories to develop his ideological position or make a political point. My interest in him is that I believe he was an astute and largely accurate critic of what he called the American Jewish establishment the liberal base of American Jewish power brokers in the 1960s and 1970s, including rabbis and philanthropists who he believed were undermining Jewish survival under the auspices of saving American Jewry. Borrowing a, for a term from Hannah Arendt, I suggest that for Kahana, the American Jewish establishment can be defined as parvenu nation. Arendt views the parvenu as one choice of emancipation, the choice to, quote, ape the Gentile, to conform to society on the demoralizing condition that he or she must not much hide, so much hide their origins as betray with the secret of his origin, the secret of his people as well. That's the parvenu in Arendt's version. The kind of quintessential assimilated American Jew. She used that phrase in reference to German Jews, of course, before the war. This doesn't only refer to secularization, but more importantly to the empty identity of Jewishness. 
A, de a, a rent right is follows and quoting from her, her book, Origins of Totalitarianism. And the more the fact of Jewish birth lost its religious, national, and socioeconomic significance in the parvenu, the more obsessive Jewishness became. The Jews were obsessed by the notion of Jewish identity as one may be by the physical defect or advantage, and addicted to it as one may be to vice. So this very notion, for example, that you see in the 1960s up until Alan Dershowitz's book in the 1990s, the disappearing American Jew. Right? There have been a number of studies over the course of the last 30 years talking about the, the disappearing of the American Jew. And there's a kind of obsessiveness we have about the disappearing of the American Jew. This obsession reflects Kahana's view of the American Jewish establishment. For both the rent and Kahana's claim that it is the parvenu more than the pariah who creates a certain kind of anti-Semitism. Because in a way, both Arendt's parvenu and Kahana's liberal American Jewish establishment are themselves anti-Semitic, in effect, if not in intent. Kahana's solutions were radical, including advocating violence as a means of Jewish survival. And it is this radicalism that may have deflected scholarly attention from his work. But I suggest that if we view his radicalism in the context of time, we can avoid that pitfall. Remember, in the mid to late 1960s was a radical time in America. The Weather Underground, the SDS, the Black Nationalist Movement, the Student Movement, the Anti-War Movement, the Student Riots in Paris, and the Black Panther Movement in Israel in the early 1970s, and later the Settler Movement in the mid-1970s. There's a fascinating documentary um, that just came out, I saw it uh, two weeks ago, on the history of the Black Panther movement called uh, The Black Panthers, The Vanguard of a Revolution. And for those of you who haven't seen it, you really should. It's actually a fascinating study. It's the first, first full-length documentary written about the history of the Black Panthers. Franz Fanon's anti-colonialist book, Wretched of the Earth, was widely read in intellectual and activist circles. In his memoir, President Obama mentions reading Fanon when he read him in a black student group in college in the early 1980s. Kahana probably never read the, the, the work of the anti-colonialist Fanon, but Kahana was very familiar with figures that perhaps are more familiar to us. He read Eldridge Cleaver, he read Stokey Carmichael, he read Huey Newton, and he read Malcolm X, all of whom were very influenced by Fanon. Kahana's Jewish Defense League, founded in 1968, is very much a part of the social upheaval at the time, identity politics, and the early baby boomers coming of age in a war-torn country. In 1967, for example, under the pseudonym Michael King, Kahana wrote a book in favor of the Vietnam War <coughs> called The Jewish Stake in Vietnam, arguing that Jewish liberals were protesting the war, and by doing so were empowering anti-Semitism and Jewish survival. Kahana's ideas about violence were no different than Malcolm X's, yet while X, Malcolm X is still read widely and written about in African American studies programs, Kahana is ignored in Jewish studies and in proper Jewish circles. But what I want to suggest is that Kahana's critique of American Jewry presents a challenge that really has not been adequately answered. In fact, I don't think it can be answered. And thus, the powers that be, the present American Jewish establishment, which is not the liberal American Jewish establishment of the 1960s for sure, must look to, differ, to a different paradigm to both acknowledge intermarriage as the necessary fruits of the American Jewish project and think about strategies to reconceive American Jewry with and not in opposition to intermarriage. I think, historically, the last great attempt to curb intermarriage in America will have been the Birthright Israel project. Because that's really what Birthright Israel was about. Birthright Israel, when Michael Steinhardt started Birthright Israel, it wasn't because he wanted American, young American Jews to go to Israel so that they decide to immigrate to Israel. Right? It's basically, if you take American, you know, American Jews at an impressionable age and bring them to Israel and give them this 10-day, all-inclusive, fully absorbed trip to Israel, that when they come back to America, the chances are less that they will intermarry. That was the intention of the project, right? And uh, a colleague of ours, Shaul Kellner, um, wrote a book called Trips That Bind, which is the first academic study of birthright Israel. 
Here, Walensky's short essay serves as simply a reality check for those in power to cultivate such change. The topic of intermarriage, Walensky suggests, is no longer relevant for most American millennial Jews. It's not the abandonment of Jewish identity. It is part of Jewish identity. Below, I'm going to try to elucidate why the Kahana would essentially agree, yet reach very different conclusions. In order to theorize Kahana here, I want to come back to Arendt again and suggest that her model of the parvenu and the pariah in what she calls the exceptional Jew. And her, her example of the exceptional Jew is Benjamin Disraeli, who was, who was elected as, uh, as a prime minister of, um, of Great Britain way back when. A Jewish prototype that largely captures Kahana's description of the American Jewish establishment. <coughs> I don't think that Kahana ever read or read, but there's a bit of interesting misinformation in the um, in the biography of a, of a rent by Elizabeth Young Brewer that may suggest an ideological affinity. There's a footnote in the first edition of the biography that states that a rent initially supported the founding of the Jewish Defense League in 1968, a point which Edward Said used as the basis of his critique of Arendt. He used that footnote as the basis of his critique of Arendt. It turned out to be the footnote was actually a mistake. And it was later corrected in the second edition of the biography. But the logic behind the error is actually worthy of note. Arendt did actually support something called the Committee for a Jewish Army in the early 1940s, until she realizes that it was part of a revisionist front. The committee was also a part, uh, also part of what became Jabotinsky's Jewish Legion that served as the overt precedent for Kahana's Jewish Defense League. Kahana was very much a, a member of, or a, a supporter of Jabotinsky's Revisionist Party. The support of political activism as an expression of Jewishness is something essential to Arendt's professional profile. While not a supporter of violence, she wrote a long treatise or a short treatise entitled On Violence, criticizing Jean-Paul Sartre's introduction to Franz Fanon's book, Retrovia. After an assessment of Kahana's position, I want to briefly turn to two influential contemporary intellectuals that offer answers to the question, why be Jewish? And these are two books that were written in the last 10 years but do so in a way that don't answer the question, why marry Jews? And thus, to my mind, prove Kahana's point that American Judaism cannot answer the latter question. Because even in its multiculturalist and neo-traditionalist turn, it remains wed to a liberalism that makes an answer to that question impossible. The first book is a book written by Dad, Dave, Rabbi David Wolpe, who some of you may have heard of. He's a very prominent conservative rabbi in Los Angeles, called Why Be Jewish? Not sure whether he knew that Kahana actually wrote a book by the same title. <laughs> <laughs> and another book that was written in 1995 with, uh, by Jonathan Sarna, who is the kind of preeminent historian of American Judaism, called A Time for Every Purpose, Young Letter Letters to the Young Jew, published, was published in 2008. Wolpe's book was 2005. Uh, I'm sorry, Wolpe's book was 1995, and Sarna's book was 2008. I use these two examples not to criticize the authors, but to illustrate how these two thinkers, one a popular rabbi and the second a celebrated Jewish historian, offer answers to the question, why be Jewish, without answering the second question, why marry Jewish? It's precisely in these works, typical in my view of contemporary Jewish thinking, in other words, aligned with early 20th century, I'm sorry, early 21st century Jewish post-liberalism, that affirm rather than disprove Kahana's critique. I want to conclude by suggesting that Kahana's prognosis may have been premature that American Jewish assimilation is temporarily saved by two things. Like, why wasn't Kahana right in his work in 1983 that American Jewish assimilation was saved by two things? The first is the advent of multiculturalism, which, among other things, gave new incentive for difference and the post-Reagan maturation of Jewish neoconservatism, which halted the full forward motion of Jewish liberalism. Yet as the polls have shown, neither multiculturalism nor Jewish neoconservatism have had much impact on 
Jewish intermarriage. Rather, multiculturalism changed the nature of the Jewish intermarried spouse's relationship to his or her Jewish identity and affiliation, but not his or her choice to marry a Gentile. And neoconservatism has moved some Jewish attention and money from classical liberal causes like civil rights, poverty, immigration, and feminism to conservative ones, particularly the rise of pro-Israelism evident in the growing influence of APEC. But multiculturalism is largely over, or at least in a state of transition, and a new era of what David Hollinger and others have called post-ethnicity is emerging for exogamy, or marrying out of one's faith or an ethnic group, is becoming normative. And where the population, Gentile and Jewish, is, increasing, is increasingly multi-ethnic. Most American Jewish teenagers today have a close relative who is a non-Jew. Jewish neoconservatism is a, is a particular articulation of widely Jewish for, a large, for largely secular Jews, but is not a substitute for Jewish communal life that can answer the question, why marry Jews? In 1972, I'm sure all of you will remember this, although it'll probably have to jog your memories. In 1972, there was a, a, a television sitcom called Bridget Loves Bernie. Right? It remains one of the mo do people remember it? Yeah. 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 It remains one of the most short-lived yet most written about television comedies of the period. Whereas shows like All in the Family were controversial about race, and the Mary Tyler Moore show was controversial about feminism, Bridget Loves Bernie was a show about intermarriage <coughs> between a Jewish man named Bernie Steinberg and an Irish Catholic woman named Bridget Fitzgerald. The show depicts an early 1970s romantic vision of love conquers all. The theme song of the show is aptly, is aptly titled Love is Crazy. And that difference is largely a veil that conceals how we are all basically the same. That was the premise of the show. The Jewish and Irish Catholic parents, the former lower middle class, the latter upper class, depict an old world sentiment that opposes intermarriage but has no reason for its opposition. As the season develops, the parents come to see the shallowness and the hypocrisy of their own obstinacy. The show immediately works, evokes strong and resilient resistance by the American Jewish community, such that the network decided to cancel the show after only one season, even though it ranked number five in the national ratings. The sitcom becomes the foundation for Kahana's book on intermarriage, Why the Jewish? Not the show itself, but what he considered to be the hypocritical protest by the American Jewish establishment. The gist of Kahada's critique in this case, as well as more generally when it comes to what he called the American Jewish establishment and what I'm calling the part of the new nation, is that hypocrisy, that is the hypocrisy that he argues is embedded in the American Jewish liberal project. The ostensible project of Jewish liberalism that undergirds American Judaism from modern orthodoxy through reform and reconstructionism is for him not the liberalization of Judaism, but the substitution of Judaism for liberalism. Liberalism and Judaism, Kahana writes, two opposing and contradictory creeds, and the Jewish establishment is committed in the marrow of its intellectual and emotional bones to the former. But their policy is shaped by the former. End quote. It is this substitution of liberalism for Judaism under the guise of accommodation to, of liberalism to Judaism that creates Bernie, the character Bernie in the TV show, and what Kahana calls Bernieism, <laughs> making Bernie a kind of modern American Jewish tevia, the simple and hapless mirror of his own world. Liberalism, Kahana argues, and again I quote, dictates intermarriage. It dictates joining clubs that allow Jews and non-Jews to mingle freely. It opposes clubs that insist upon being Jewish, lest their children intermarry. It opposes Judaism as a separate parochial faith, the only kind of Judaism that can save Bernie from Bridget. The 1960s liberalism has been altered through multiculturalism and rooted cosmopolitanism, but its basic tenets remain autonomy, pluralism, free choice, and individualism. There's a tension, Kahana would say, incompatibility 
between liberalism and Judaism that Kana claims the American Jewish establishment refuses to acknowledge precisely because doing so would undermine its commitment to Americanization. From a different perspective, yet one that is worth comparison, <coughs> contemporary theologian, Jewish theologian David Novak argues in his covenantal rights that the core tenet of liberalism, the status of the individual qua individual, that is distinct from any communal membership, has no status in the Hebrew Bible and classical Jewish sources, and thus is foreign to any kind of traditional Judaism. Novak's call for Jewish collectivism as an alternative to liberalism shares something substantial with Kahana's critique of American Judaism. But you see, Kahana doesn't really blame Bernie for marrying Bridget. In fact, Kahana understands Bernie quite well. He writes as follows. Bernie was honest. He took the whole thing and he junked it. Bernie sees the hypocrisy of American Judaism's empty case against intermarriage, a parochialism that has no foundation, an exceptionalism that has no content, and reacts in a sensible manner, or at least one consistent with the ostensible Jewish values in which he was raised. Bernie is the child of the American Jewish establishment, and thus the American Jewish establishment's protest against the television sitcom illustrates for Kahana the extent to which the establishment is caught in an inextricable bind. It cannot live with the consequences of its own choices, and it refuses to entertain the possibility that its choices are flawed. On this point, Kahana quotes Rabbi Nathan Perlman, who was then the Rabbi Emeritus of Temple Emmanuel in Manhattan. This is back in the 1970s. And Rabbi Perlman writes as follows, Jews have fought for years to mix freely in our society, and intermarriage is the result. I have nothing against intermarriage if the family is to be a Jewish one." End quote. This is one of the leading reform rabbis of America in the 1970s. I would add here that Mordechai Kaplan takes a similar, even radical stand in the 1930s, when the intermarriage rate among Jews and non-Jews was in the single digits. In the 1930s, in his book, The Judaism as a Civilization, he writes as follows. Judaism should meet all situations that might lead to mixed marriages, not fearingly or begrudgingly, or grudgingly, but in the spirit of encountering an unexpected development. With such an attitude toward intermarriage, Judaism would avert the tragedy of Jewish parents who consider the child married to a Gentile as lost to them. With belief in the integrity and value of its own civilization, the Jewish partner to the marriage could achieve moral ascendancy and make Judaism the civilization of the home, for nothing is so contrary to the idea of cultural and spiritual cooperation as the unqualified refusal of one element of the population to intermarry with the other. This was written in the 1930s, which is actually quite startling. The intermarriage rate among Jews in the 1930s was about 6 or 7%. Few other, um, like few others in his time, Kaplan understood the dilemma of democracy, and more importantly, the price of the American Jewish project, which we are all a product of. To Rabbi Perlman, Kahana's res responds as follows, and I quote, and so we arrive at the ultimate theater of the Jewish absurd. It is all right not to be Jewish, as long as you are Jewish. <laughs> The halakhic rule that a Jew is someone born of a Jewish mother or a convert according to the proper halakhic procedures is cast into limbo with people defining Jew in every and any way they care to, end quote. Here, in some sense, Kaplan might agree with Kahana's assessment but disagree with his conclusions when he writes, and this is, Ka this is Kaplan written in the 30s, what is valuable is the Jewish social heritage or civilization and not physical descent, end quote. Bernie can still marry Bridget and be a part of Kaplan's Jewish civilization. Kahana argues that the vacuity of the American Jewish establishment strips any positive value of Jewishness which leaves the Bernies of the world to define themselves only in opposition to the Gentile. Bernie is a Jew simply because he's not a good. <laughs> <laughs> But that kind of oppositional Jew has no good reason to marry, not to marry Bridget. The example Kahana brings here is a case of someone he calls Rudnik the Trafnik. 
<coughs> Rudnick, the sinner, was a congregant that Kahanan knew when he was a rabbi on Long Island in the early 1960s. One year, Rudnick erected an eight-foot Hanukkah menorah on his front lawn. And Kahana asked him, he said, Rudnick, I know that you're not a religious man. What's with the eight-foot Hanukkah menorah? And Rudnick replied, Rabbi, the first year I moved in here, I was the only Jew on the block. And those neighbors of mine lit their Christmas tree decorations to beat the band. I made up my mind that no guy was going to have a better holiday than me. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I built the menorah. <laughs> <laughs> to this, Kahana replies, what makes Rudnick a Jew? Clearly, only the non-Jew. Rudnick is the, that proverbial stiff-necked person whose Jewishness is totally negative, void of anything in its own right, but flares up every so often because he must show the goy that he also has something. There are the Jews who have remained Jews because of the goy. That which they were not prepared to accept from the Jew, they cling to because of the goy. That's Kahanas. Those are Kahanas. This oppositional Judaism not only resulted in eight foot Hanukkah menorah, more pointedly, it speaks of the Jew whose Jewishness amounts to not having a non Jewish daughter in law. Rudnik, Kahana suggests, is not a person. Rudnick is a concept. He's Bernie's father and mother. He's the Frankenstein of the American Jewish establishment. Now it's true, as we'll see, that Wolpe and Sarna speak to the Rudnicks of the world, and they offer a positive reason why be Jewish, but they're reasons that are still founded in liberalism and the universal message of Judaism, rather than its particularistic and obligatory demands, still do not give a reason why Bernie, Rudnick's conceptual son, should not marry Bridget. The problem with the American Jewish project and Kahana's assessment is twofold. First, it's not a religion. If by religion we mean a time-honored set of practices and beliefs founded on the awe of the Almighty that make demands on us, its constituents, including a demand to remain separate from the other nations, it is rather a folklore constructed of ethnic bits and pieces resting on nostalgia. Arne Eisen's claim of nostalgia as the modern Jewish mitzvah in his, in his book, Rethinking, American, Rethinking Modern Judaism, fits quite nicely into Kahana's view. Second, it's founded on the symbiosis between Americanism and Judaism, something that we kind of take for granted. Here, Kahana cites a 1966 report from the Council of Jewish, Jewish Federations and Welfare Funds. So this is, this is basically the language of the 1966 Council of Jewish Federations and Welfare Funds. And I quote, we are American Jews. Our ties to our American heritage and our affinities with our fellow Jews everywhere commingle comfortably with our United States nationality. We can be whole as Jews and whole as Americans, and there is no conflict within us. The foremost obligation of the Jewish community remains the preservation of American democratic pluralism. It is only within the context of our unceasing efforts to maintain an economically sound and morally just American society that we can begin to arrange our other priorities." End quote. And I think that this quote, in a sense, really is the foundation upon which most of us as American Jews were raised. This assessment of American Judaism in some way reflects an earlier symbiosis between Judentum and Deutschtum, Judaism and Germanness in Weimar Germany. The difference in tragedy for Kahana is that in America, it actually worked. On this reading, it was Nazi anti-Semitism anti in Germany that ironically saved Judaism, albeit at the price of six million Jews. Kahana quotes Saul Hofstein in a 19, 1974 American Jewish Congress meeting as follows. <laughs> Somehow, parents need to be helped to affirm that one can be liberal, democratic, against discrimination, yet have a deep conviction about Jewish identity and Jewish continuity, Hopstein says. But what is this somehow, Kahana asks? Once the American Jewish establishment chooses liberalism, they really have no answer. That is, they can answer the question, why be Jewish, that Bernie will either accept or reject, but they can never really answer the question, why marry Jewish? Kahana suggests that Bernie intuits that there's something wrong with his comfortable symbiosis between Judaism and Americanism. 
He sees the hypocrisy at the core of the argument. In short, Bernie does not accept the hyphen between Jewish and American, or at least he needs a better reason why the hyphen should prevent him from marrying Bridget Fitzgerald. Given the constraints of time, I'll not, I don't want to get, get into a, a Kahana's detailed analysis to the question. But I do want to suggest that Kahana thinks that American Judaism, and I, I, I think it would still be the case today for him if he were alive. Maybe not. Maybe a little bit different. Is hopelessly caught in self-contradiction. And thus, mass aliyah to Israel is the old, for Kahana is the only way to extricate Bernie from the flesh pots of hypocrisy. And he also presents traditional Judaism as one antidote to liberalism, where the demand to sacrifice replaces the right to choose. There's a long excursus on Jewish education and the liberal Jewish commitment to public education, but in general, there's little, little, little new or worthy of note in these sections of the book. But before I turn to Walpi and Sarna, I want to suggest that from our station in 2015, Kahana's assessment seems quite dated a product of the 60s and 70s liberalism and assimilationism <coughs> that predates multiculturalism and the rise of Jewish neoconservatism. So it's worth asking, does multiculturalism and the Judaism produced in its wake really answer Bernie's question? Does the secular pro-Israelism of Jewish neoconservatism really give Bernie a reason not to marry Bridget? In both cases, I would say no. Multiculturalism may give Bernie new reasons to be Jewish in a positive way, but it is precisely multiculturalism's celebration of difference that would not prevent him from marrying Bridget, even as a more identifiable or even affiliated Jew. So he just he may bring Bridget to synagogue, but he would still marry her. Bridget's difference should also be respected. So why should Bernie convince her to convert? There's an interesting, uh, it was an interesting op-ed in the Wall Street Journal by Arnold Eisen, the Chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary, that he thinks that conservative rabbis now should begin to try to convert the non-Jewish spouses of intermarriage in conservative communities. And there's a response that I wrote to that because I think it's a kind of disingenuous uh, uh, question, which we can talk about in the questions after if you want. Bernie just as easily could celebrate difference inside his marriage as in, as, as in his community. And if we take the results of the recent Pew poll seriously, this seems to be precisely what American Jews are doing. About 94% of American Jews polled in that Pew poll study, 94% of American Jews polled felt, quote, they were proud to be Jewish. Yet 72% were married to non-Jews. As Walensky suggests, millennials, the first generation of multicultural of the first generation of multicultural America, may accept the answer to why be Jewish that may have nothing to do with the question why marry Jewish. The in terms of the rise of neoconservatism, the newly found Jewish secular nationalism among many Jewish American Jews is often as devoid of Jewish content as Kahana's Bernie's of the 1960s. Their identity is just now just focused on Jewish causes, particularly Israel, rather than universal ones. Many have abandoned their liberalism, but have not replaced it with anything substantively Jewish. Their pro-Israelism is in some way a product of a negative assessment. This all constitutes a kind of neo-Rudnikism. Muslims hate the Jews, so I'm not going to allow those Arabs to get anything. This may be a good case for Bernie not to marry Fatima. <laughs> but it's not a good case for Bernie not to marry Bridget. The two new turns in America after Kahana, multiculturalism and neoconservatism, and the ways in which Judaism has molded itself to both give new answers, albeit not such good answers to why be Jewish, but not, in my view, why marry Jewish. In other words, the hypocrisy that Kahana suggested is embedded in the core of the American Jewish project until today. So what do Wolpe and Sarna have to say? David Wolpe's Why Be Jewish and Sarna is a time for every purpose letters to a young Jew. It was actually a letter to his daughter. Are two contemporary attempts to answer the question why be Jewish, which is linked in some way to the question why marry Jewish. Wolpe never addresses the question why marry Jewish, which seems odd given that he's writing at a time when that question seems to be more crucial than the first. 
What I suggest in reading Wolpe and Sarna is not that they are per per perpetuating the hypocrisy that Kahana accused the American Jewish establishment of in the 70s. Both Wolpe and Sarna write precisely to answer the question why be Jewish in a positive way, yet went to a particular liberal, liberal Jewish Amer American liberal Jewish project in the age of multiculturalism. Each offers a Judaism or Jewishness that is inspiring in regards to personal spirituality and meaning, but not sufficient in regards to the question of why Bernie should not marry Bridget. This is because, and here I think Ahana may be right, the American Jewish Liberal Project cannot answer that question and remain committed to its liberal precepts. Rather, I suggest moving forward, American Judaism must learn to live with intermarriage as an integral part of its community and think of constituting Jewish life in America with and not in opposition to it. Wolpe offers his reader with an elegant and loving assessment of Judaism as liberalism, Judaism as a religion with a universal message. One can easily substitute the word liberalism for Judaism throughout the book. In this sense, Wolpe's book is, proves Kahana's point. Sentences such as, Judaism's most sing important single teaching is that every human being is created in the image of God. Or, Judaism sees human beings as a measure of all things. Or, the first demand of a Jew is goodness. Or, Judaism is about changing the world. Those sentences fill Wolpe's book. Why be Jewish is, uh, the, the book Why Be Jewish is clearly the ode of a rabbi who is in love with his Judaism. But it doesn't answer why Bernie should not marry Bridget. When Wolpe does address the question of peoplehood, it's with a very light and universalist touch. And he writes as follows. There is no Jewish race. Jews are found in every racial group in the world. Jewish destiny is not bred in the genes. Jewish destiny is the function of memory and vision, end quote. Very similar to Kaplan in a way. He argues that the Jewish concept of chosenness was, quote, disfigured by the ugliness of history. Judaism did not insist that only its adherents could be saved. Judaism declared that the righteous of all nations have a share in the world to come. So Jewish chosenness was actually less exclusive than the chosenness characteristic of many other chosen things. The simplicity and, to my, to my assessment, inaccuracy of many of these statements is really not the issue. This is not a scholarly book. It's an inspirational book. But what exactly is it supposed to inspire? Make no mistake, Wolpe writes, in becoming Jewish, one joins not just a people, a, a religion, but a people. Even Jews who do not have strong convictions or any religious convictions can feel strongly about their identity as Jews, because Judaism is broader than any statement of faith. It is, it is a civilization. It is a culture, ultimately a sort of national family. What Wolpe does is take the basic beliefs and intuitions of liberal America and show how Judaism embraces and embodies those beliefs. It may give Bernie a sense of his liberal American values and how they can be viewed as an expression of his Jewishness, but it certainly wouldn't give him a reason not to marry Bridget. Sign as a time for every purpose is less poetic than Wolpe's book, more concrete and more historical. Unlike Wolfe, Sarna devotes an entire chapter to assimilation that directly addresses our question at hand. That is the chapter is framed around the festival of, Han of Hanukkah, both because of the story of the <coughs> both because the story of the Maccabees is, on one very American reading, an anti-assimilationist story, and because Hanukkah's proximity to Christmas poses challenges to the contemporary Jew in America. Given this proximity and the anti-assimilationist nature of how Sarna understands the story, he suggests that Hanukkah, quote, should really be celebrated <coughs> as the anti-Christmas. <laughs> In response to the rhetorical question of, but you, Abba, go to Christmas parties, Sarna responds, yes. <coughs> as a Jew, it comes naturally for me to feel both part of the larger society in which I live and simultaneously separate from it. Why we have, uh, end quote. Why here we have moved somewhat from the more classical Jewish liberals of the 60s, the devotion to the American Jewish symbiosis remains. Jewish distinctiveness and thus survival rests on that precarious hyphen. On intermarriage, Sarna rehearses the standard arguments. It dilutes Judaism, forging a Christmas Hanukkah hybrid, he writes. <coughs> 
It threatens the preservation of the Jewish group, and etc. Et he gives his daughter a few examples of historical precedent, the Ten Lost Tribes, the disappearance of the Jewish community in the Caribbean island of Jamaica. I'm not sure why he gave that example. There are many other examples. <laughs> he offers the standard warning by saying, the issue may literally mean life or death for people surviving remnant. But Sarna is too aware of American Judaism to be convinced by his own arguments. Channeling Mordecai Kaplan's comment above, he writes, quote, Ironically, the very qualities that have made American society so desirable to us as Jews, its tolerance, its liberal tradition, and its emphasis on individual rights and privileges, are the same qualities that facilitate marriage across ethnic and religious lines. Indeed, the more we win acceptance as equal and desirable fellow citizens, the more likely we are to lose our distinctive identity through marital assimilation." End quote. As a professional and renowned historian of American Judaism, Sarner knows that those arguments, that, that those arguments only work if they're supported by something more demanding. But he can't really articulate that to his daughter. So he ends the letter by writing the following. And I quote, so please think about this as you watch the candles slowly burn down on Hanukkah. What will your legacy be? And he concludes with the predictable yet still startling words of a loving American parent. And I quote, whatever you choose, meaning whoever you choose to marry, your mother and I will always love you. Happy Hanukkah, love, Abba. Whatever you choose, your mother and I will always love you. The kind words of a committed Jew who deeply understands the precariousness of his liberal commitments, especially as they relate to his millennial daughter. As a liberal, Sarner must state that the choice is yours to make, and the price will not be alienation from your family. <coughs> this is also part of Sarner's Americanism. American religion is about the individual personal choice to be Jewish, to affiliate and identify as such. And this choice does not necessarily lead to the choice to marry Jewish, because the personal choice is not a necessary extension of collective obligation. As a traditionalist, Sarna can only hope his millennial daughter makes that choice. The American Jewish establishment of the 70s could not accept the public depiction of Jewish intermarriage in Bridget Loves Birdie, and therefore forced the show to be canceled, even though Kahana claims they were the ones who actually created the sitcom. <laughs> Sarna understands that choice is a real possibility in a liberal world and remains devoted to defending the very world that enabled Jews to thrive in America. Here then, hypocrisy is replaced by anxiety and melancholy. Kahana would likely claim that the two answers to why be Jewish only confirm his understanding of the American Jewish project. The poetic words of Wolpe and the honest and heartfelt words of Sarna do not, cannot answer Bernie's question. Nor can they really answer the question of the millennials in Walensky's article. This is not for a lack of trying, but because in Kahana's terms there really is no answer. And here Kaplan's words from the 1930s are still relevant. Inter-ethnic marriage is part of the American experiment. To the extent that Jews include themselves in that experiment is the reality that is not worth resisting because resistance is resistance to the entire experiment. Jewish civilization, according to Kaplan, must be constructed with, with inter-ethnic marriage as it is predictable and, I might add, inevitable and in a necessity part of the fabric of American Jewish society. Kahana's answer is either aliyah to Israel or a, or a kind of survivalist enclavism that is not explicit, that, it, that is not very um, uh, attractive to the Jews. That is, Kahana believed that ethnic groups should only marry those in their ethnic group. And he wasn't specifically about Jews. He felt that Asians should only marry Asians, Italians should only marry Italians, right? So on and so forth. Most American Jews, most American Jews, for example, were against uh, the, uh, the, the Bob Jones University policy of uh, forbidding inter-ethnic dating. You remember back in the first George Bush, when George, the first George just spoke at Bob Jones University, there was a kind of upheaval about that. And American, basically American Jews would all be opposed to any kind of legislation forbidding Jews from marrying non-Jews, right? That would be considered to be anti-Semitic. So American Jews want to live in a society where they can intermarry, but they don't. 
Kahana believes that all ethnic groups should only marry each other, which is why we, why one reason why he had a lot of respect for the black nationalist movement. That kind of America would not have offered Jews the opportunities they presently enjoy and arguably could not have survived as a liberal democracy. For Kahana, the survival of the Jews in America would require them to abandon their Americanism and realize a separatist reality not unlike the enclavism we see among certain ultra-Orthodox Jews. In this sense, then, Kahana's assessment in 1983 remains a serious challenge to respond to the millennial Jews for whom why be Jewish is no longer linked to why marry Jewish. Because marrying Jewish may be preferable, but it is no longer a central part of their multicultural and post-ethnic Jewish identity. Wolfley and Sarger's answer to the first question, why be Jewish, does not really answer the second, why marry Jewish. Sarger all but admits that. For that second question to become relevant, if indeed it can or should, would require an entirely new way of thinking about Jewishness in an increasingly post-ethnic world. But before entering that uncharted territory, Jewish professionals need to acknowledge where we are. I think that Kahana's critique of the American Jewish establishment in the 1960s and 1970s, albeit not necessarily his solutions, can better help us understand the contours of that challenge. Thank you for your time.